Amen. Thanks, Megan. Hey, good morning. All right, good. We're awake. We had a little trouble last service. It's okay. Uh, all grace. All good. All right. Glad you're all here this morning. If you're uh, with us online, thanks for uh, just watching us this morning. We hope you're, uh, you're blessed uh, by our time uh, together this morning. Uh, yeah, we were decorating the church all last week. Uh, I spent the week uh, decorating my house. Anybody do that? Do you, decor- you do your own decorations. I'm not asking if your house is decorated. You do your own decorations, okay, yeah. I was putting my lights on the house, okay. We get a, we get a separate award because we did it ourselves, okay. So just if we get in any sort of competition, we're in a separate category, okay. The people that you know, that pay to have that done. Okay, we love you too. Your house looks great, but we worked really, really hard, okay? <laughs> Shout out, okay? That's all I'm, that's all I'm saying. But every time uh, I, I put lights on my house, I cannot help but immediately think of the movie Christmas Vacation, mostly because I am trying not to be like Clark Griswold and fall off the roof or do something crazy, right? Uh, But if you've not seen this movie, if you're from a different generation, go application from today is go watch that movie. It's been on TV now for like two or three weeks, all right? Or just stream it on demand, whatever you do, right? But the whole, like, he's trying to get all these decorations up. He's trying to get them all, all in the house, right? And he wants his family to experience all of this. He's, he's got his in-laws. He's trying to impress them, right? So he brings everybody outside when he gets it all set up, and the lights don't come on, and his family just immediately, they bail on him. They're like, thanks, we're out. We're out. Like, they don't even try to, like, help or anything, right? Uh, they're just like, no, we're, we're out. We're not, we're not going to wait for you. We're not, we're not doing any, any of that, right? Now, eventually, he gets the lights on, right? It's actually like his wife figures out the switch in the garage, right? But we're not going to tell him that, right? But the lights are on in the house, and they get to celebrate. There's tears. There's hugging. Uh, Cousin Eddie shows up. You know, it's just a wonderful, wonderful experience, and they're all just joyous and, and laughing and celebrating, right? Uh, but it was really because they were, they were annoyed because they had to wait. We don't like... We don't like waiting. And so if you, if you didn't, haven't caught on, like we're, we've got like 30 days, less than 30 days till Christmas. So just, you know, not to cause panic for any of the parents that don't have your kids' presence yet, but like we're, we're, we're in that season, right? We just, we moved through Thanksgiving and now it's, it's, it's Christmas on for the entire, the entire time. And so there's always some anxiousness or some angst, right, that comes during Christmas time, it could be you're awaiting uh, a, a, a present, you're waiting for a family to show up, you've got a certain gift, kids are waiting for Santa to show up, right? Like we want, like we're, we're just, we spend the whole season waiting and the problem is, is that we're just not very good at waiting. We don't like it. It's uncomfortable, Right, kid. The way I mean, think about how your kid is waiting for Santa to show up. Right, they show all the emotions on the outside, and what you've, what they're showing is what you're feeling on the inside. Right, you're waiting for the family to get there because you're like, we gotta eat. Like, let's go. I mean, you're just like, man, we just did this at Thanksgiving. Like, can't they just be on time this time? I don't understand. Right, all of this waiting just annoy, annoys us to the point of death. Right, we're just, but we're not good. At waiting, and so in a similar way, the nation of Israel was doing this, except they were waiting for about eight hundred years. Okay, they're waiting their promised king, and so that's where we're going to be today. We're going to be in Isaiah nine one through seven. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. Uh, if you have a, if you phone, you've got the Bible app. You can go there. That's fine too. Um, if you're new to to the Bible, uh, you can Google it. It'll just pop up for you. Maybe something like Bible Gateway. Uh, you can find Isaiah nine uh, one through one through seven. And so um, this this might be the most important messianic prophecy because it's it's the culmination of several prophetic messages in the Old Testament that begin all the way back in Genesis. And so we don't have time today to go through all of these different passages, but uh, if you want this afternoon, go read Genesis 3, 14 and 15. Go read 2 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel 2, 7. Go read Psalm 2, 1 and 2, and you'll kind of see, and you'll start piecing these all together where you eventually land in Isaiah 9. And so that's where we find ourselves. And what we see is that Jesus was the plan all along. There is no plan B. 
Jesus is the plan all along. And so we find ourselves in Isaiah. And so if this is your, if this is your first time to read the Bible, by the way, don't go home and try to read the rest of Isaiah. I do not encourage you to start in this book, okay? Um, it's not just because it's 66 chapters, okay? But go, go like James, it's like five chapters, right? That's like really, really, really simple. But it's more so just because this was a tumultuous period of history. I mean, Assyria has started this like, uh, this pillage the village campaign. I don't know if you win elections on that or not, but like they're just coming in and they're just ransacking everybody. They're literally taking people and they're just dragging them off into, uh, into, ca- into captivity. And so Isaiah enters the picture and he begins prophesying or he begins forecasting the future in which prov- begins to provide hope for the people of God. It's a time of political unrest. It's a time of war. It's a time of distress. And so it's against this backdrop of, of doom and gloom where we find ourselves as we read Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. So the, the people of Israel, they are desperately waiting for some sort of relief. So if you have your Bibles, follow along with me. Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And so immediately in verses one and two, we begin to see this contrast, right, between light and darkness. And so it introduces this future king who's gonna bring a period of light and peace to God's people. And so this light, this joy, is what, this peace is what sharply contrasts the war, the distress, and the darkness in which they currently find themselves. It's also here where you begin to see, if you're familiar with, with the New Testament, you're familiar with, you might be familiar with uh, these geographical locations, such as places like Galilee, and so if you're familiar with Jesus's earthly ministry, uh, you recognize this is, this is what the prophet is talking about regarding Galilee, because Galilee is where the majority of Jesus's earthly ministry takes place. And so this northern part of Israel, this area uh, of Zebulun, this area of Naphtali, this is the first part to fall to Assyria. And so it's here that we see an entire portion of the people of Israel who were waiting desperately for liberation And so at some point in their future, God will honor them by sending a new light. And this light spreads from Galilee. And we see this picture of light and darkness used oftentimes in in scripture, right? Darkness is really a a symbol. It's a a symbol of of the absence of God's presence. But light, on the other hand, is is a sign of hope. It's a sign of deliverance. Uh, from the darkness that pervaded the land. And so Jesus tells us even in John 8, 12, where he says like, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And so those walking in darkness in verse two have seen a great light. And this light was a sign that God had not completely given up on his people. A new day of hope and light will eventually arrive. And so all, all they could do is wait. And they were waiting. We get to verses three through five, and this this metaphor of light and darkness kind of just continues on. 
as it leads into the climax of verses six and seven. So, you know, once you begin to experience light, what, what follows is, is liberation and, cele- and celebration, right? Uh, for those of you who have kids, you may be able to relate with me when one of them is sick during the night, okay? It is the most horrible experience you'll ever feel, Right? And I'm specifically talking about myself who's not been afflicted by anything at that point other than a crying kid, but I'm just like, when's this gonna be over? Because I really am just, this has gotta end. I gotta go to sleep. Okay, so it's like, okay, it's two o'clock. Fall asleep here in about 10 minutes. I can get at least four hours, right? So you start playing all these mind games with yourself and it's just like, morning, just please come already, okay? Like, I'm a horrible parent, right? I'm not even thinking about the care for my own kid, right? TJ, show some empathy, my goodness, right? It's always my wife who does this really well. I'm I'm terrible because I'm just thinking about sleep, right? But when that morning comes, right, that that dawn, it breaks and you're like, okay, thank you, God, that that is over. (laughs) Never again, right? This is part of parenthood, right? We experience all this. But essentially, right, that's, that's what verses three through five are talk, talking about, right? One of the commentaries I read, they, they just called this a, a celebrative joy. The people are celebrating the freedom they're experiencing. And then there's two examples that Isaiah gives where he gives, one, he gives this example of the harvest time, right? Where we don't have lots of farms around here. Last time I checked, right? Lots of houses, lots of buildings. But when they would just have this like, this massive crop that would come in, you literally had the people just jumping up and down, just like, we've, we can eat, like we've got food, we can sit, we're gonna make money, this is awesome, right? They're celebrating because of the amount of food that they've just got. And the other one is as after wartime, where they literally are marching into the city and they're carrying everything that they've plundered. They've got all of their supplies, they've got people, they've got prisoners, and people are rejoicing because of this. The, the victory. And so all Isaiah is doing right here is he's pointing back to what the Lord does over and over and over again. And that is deliver his people. Notice verse five, the burning of the, mil- the military equipment. Is, it's a symbol that the war, that the oppression has finally ceased. Again, the people now get to experience the spoils of the victory, not of a victory that they've won. It's a victory that the Lord has, has won. You know, the, the challenge, I, I think, is, is the same for us. We've, th- we've talked a lot about this, this last year, right? The March 15th date, whenever we shut down, whatever that is, right? Some of y'all, some of y'all may have moved here from somewhere else and may have been shut down before that. But some of us, if not all of us, have faced some sort of difficult challenges or, or challenge or maybe just several different challenges along the way. And so what my, my hope is, is, is that you can, you're just able to go back and just look back and just see how God has sustained you, how God has provided for you over this past year. This is a great activity for families. I just encourage you maybe to sit down at dinner time, maybe tonight, maybe this week sometime, and just think about how God has sustained you. How has God provided for you during, uh, during this past year? You can spend some time maybe by yourself just journaling about some of those, time, uh, some of those things. You know, I'm not trying to paint some sort of like, you know, rosy picture, right? But what I'm trying to do is just help you gain, uh, gain larger, a larger perspective about what's going on. Sometimes you just have to pull yourself up out of the weeds to kind of look, look ahead, to look around and go, hey, look, this is where God has brought me to this moment. And I also know that there are are those of you in this room right now facing challenges right now. And let me just tell you, God sees you and we see you too. Like you were never designed to accomplish or try to go through any of these challenges by yourself. You know why? Because you can't, you can't. And so if, if, there's a, if, there's, if there's some challenges or there's something, if there's, if there's a need we can meet, we'd love to just chat with you. You can find, uh, I'll be down here, Megan will be down here at the end of the service. We'd love, to, we'd love just to talk with you how we can help. So what follows, 
as we keep reading, is six and seven is the promise of the true king. Now, you can feel this building. It's not really just because like, you may be familiar with this, with this passage, but it's more so because God is going to deliver on his promise. And so Isaiah continues to reveal more of God's plan. And so it was never going to be met through some normal human ruler. It was never going to be met through an earthly king. It was never going to be met through, uh, through effort alone, right? It was always going to be through an ordained king. And so what follows the end of war is the king and his rule. And so this is not a mere coincidence, right? It's a gracious act of God. And so verse six explains the, the deliverance of the people because he's now gonna accept like this, this burden of rule and he's gonna carry it on his shoulders. And so what follows are eight words, but really they could be eight names by themselves. Basically, this king is the most qualified individual to rule. There was no other king. There was no other king capable of, of carrying out this plan. And so what these titles represent are his character, but they also represent his roles. And so you get into wonderful counselor, right? You contrast that with the immediate context in which King Ahaz, the king at this time, he's made decisions that ruined his people. We have a counselor who provides divine guidance that's available, available to us through his word, Right? If you need counseling, right, you don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't ignore your counselor. You go see your counselor, and our counselor is available to us, right? We just have to set time aside to read it. You've got to commit to it daily. You've got to mine scripture to pull out those promises, to pull out those treasures of what God is really doing, and let him speak directly to your heart, He's mighty God. So not only can he provide wise counsel, he can also execute those wise plans. He's also the only one who has the power to overcome sin and death. And he defeated that when he went to the cross for you and me. And so when you trust in him, what you're doing, you're basically just declaring that you're not mighty, that there's one mighty God, there's one mighty king who is able to overcome sin and death and you're not able to do that on your own. Everlasting father. You know, fathers are probably a really rare way to uh, describe a, a king, but it's really just how the king is gonna relate to his subjects. He's gonna love them perfectly. He's gonna offer grace. He's gonna discipline when, it, when appropriate. He's gonna lead as, as necessary. And so this everlasting father desires a relationship with you. And so again, he's in now inviting you into his family to be with him forever. And then Prince of Peace. He's pointing, Isaiah is pointing to a time far beyond when their, when their Messiah actually arrives. He's pointing to a time of eternal peace in which there will be no end. And so when this, this, this is tied to the title of prince, what you find is an administrator who, who now administers the benefits of peace during his gentle reign. Again, because of our sin, we are at war with God and Jesus brings peace between man and God. And it's a forecast of the peace that is to come in the kingdom of God. Of God. Again, this proves, all this does is proves that Jesus was the perfect plan. There was no plan B. Now you look back at all the judges, all the kings, everybody that had gone before him were never going to be elevated to the status of this coming king. That's why God, I mean, God even warned the people in, in Samuel when they started, you know, just calling out, hey, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king, we want an earthly king, right? And God warns them, he says, no. You don't want an earthly king, it's not gonna be good. And God grants him a king anyway, he gives him Saul. And from that point forward, you see the disaster. Yes, there were some kings who, you know, did what was right in, in the eyes of the Lord, but they were never going to match this true ordained, godly king. He was the plan all along. And they were waiting 
for the one true king. And so are we. We wait. This is where, this is where we find ourselves now is that we're waiting for this one true king uh, to, to show up, to, 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 to return, right? We're waiting. The question is, so how do, how do we wait? How do we wait? How do we wait being on the other side knowing that this king has already arrived? And so there's three things I want us to, I want us to look at today. The first one is, is wait patiently. Just looking at how we can wait, especially during this, this season. So that first one is wait patiently. We've talked about this. Israel was not very patient. I mean, it didn't take them that long to, to, to get, just to create a golden calf after, after they've been delivered from Egypt, right? I mean, they're just like, we're going to make an idol right now. They were done. They didn't wait. I mean, part of the whole reason why they're conquered is because their refusal to wait on the Lord. You know, they tried to establish their own kings. They started establishing their own idols other than that golden calf. They were to await his counsel, his guidance, his instruction, him. And so we, where we find ourselves, right, is we, we kind of live in this tension between uh, Christ's arrival where he, he's already come, but he's not, he's not coming yet. And so we, we, we call this the, the kind of the already not yet. And so what we do now is we just hold on to the promises of God. What I've, what I've recently really figured out for, for just my, maybe, maybe it's myself, but I want to share this with you, is that it really comes down to just how your posture is. How's your posture? You gotta place yourself in a posture of gratitude. And you might be sitting there going like, hey, I just did that for a week, okay? That's good, that's all, I, that's all you got, right? I got my little thankful journal, I've journaled in it, I'm good, right? No more. But you gotta stay in that posture. It's a humble posture. And when you stay in that humble posture, you're submitting yourself daily to the Lord to say, you know what? Like, none of this has been on me. I didn't do any of this. God, you, you're the one. You're why I'm here. It's all about your posture. It's about gaining perspective and seeing God in everything you do. Students, uh, this, I, I know uh, your life can seem out of control. You've got so many different challenges to navigate from relationships uh, to, to sports, to grades, to where you're gonna go to school, to parents, okay, just being honest, okay? You've got all these different things that you have to try, try, to, try to navigate, right? And it, what happens is, is you're, you, you start searching for different outlets to say, you know what, uh, enough with this, I wanna find something else, I wanna find something, I wanna find something different, to just get me out of the hamster wheel. And it takes a humble posture to surrender daily. That you're, You just wake up and you say, I'm gonna live differently today. I'm gonna live my life surrendered to the one true king. I think for the rest of us, I, I think it means really just slowing down during the Christmas season. And we talk about that every year. I mean, you could come in and be like, we're gonna talk about slowing down, we kinda know, right? But really, how are you gonna surrender daily how are you gonna to submit to say, you know what, I'm, I'm not gonna speed up here. I'm gonna live my life in submission to the holy king. And so for the next four or five weeks, whatever, how, how many, how many uh, weeks we have left, right? Com commit to just using this right here. This is available. And this is what's gonna help guide you through uh, the Christmas season, right? You can pick them up outside. You can, uh, you can find it online. But this is what's gonna help guide you through this season to help you slow down and live in a, in a posture where you're surrendering daily to the king. And look, may, maybe it loses its splendor after one week. Stay patient. Stay patient. And just allow God to massage your heart during this season so that when you get to December 31st, you can hit the ground running. You know how you, what you're gonna read through. You know you're gonna spend time in God's word in 2022 and that's gonna set you up well to start the year off right. 
Because what will happen is, is that your patience will build instead of your anxiety. Wait patiently. We also wait purposefully. We've, we've recently shared one of our values is that we're running out, of time, uh, running out of time. And so what sits on the clock tower outside, if you've never seen that, is, is John 9, 4. And it says on that clock tower, it says, night cometh. Our time is limited. And so we live with this urgency to help expand God's kingdom. Friends, you and I have a purpose to, where we can live our lives each day to help accomplish the mission of the Great Commission. And so, so God has specifically given us all a purpose. And so that purpose is not to live with an eye on the short term where I'm supposed to just help, like, help like, build up my, my reservoir, right? To, to help me figure out how I'm gonna retire in 30 to 40 to 50 years, whatever that may be. Or I'm trying to figure out, hey, how can I send my kid to college, right? That's all short term. Every decision you make should be for the eternal glory of God. Because there's a day when, when Christ will come again to rescue all of those who are found to be in him. And those without Christ will be eternally separated from him. And so we have a job to do. We say this, our mission is the great commission. So practically what that may look like for you is uh, it may just look like blessing your neighbors during the Christmas season. And I'm not, I'm not talking about the city, right? I'm not talking about blessing our neighbors in the city. Yes, we're gonna have opportunities to do that. We're gonna collect shoes. We're gonna do all the nations over at, over at, uh, over at Jackal Elementary. I'm talking about your neighbors that live on your street, I'm talking about the neighbors that live down the hall from you. I'm talking about the neighbors that live in your apartment complex. Do they know who you are? I'm not even asking if they know Jesus. I'm asking, do they know who you are? Because you could be the one that introduces them to the light of the gospel. But they gotta know who you are first. Again, we've been given a purpose, and so we wait with a purpose. And finally, we wait peacefully. We wait peacefully. These days, right, can seem as dark and hopeless as in the days of Isaiah, and God has promised to bring peace and justice to this world through his Messiah. And so who you trust during these times determines if you're at peace with God. He is our peace with God. And so what happens then is we also, that also means we have peace with one another. It's a little bit of what Grant Glover talked about last week, right? But this peace is vertical. So I have peace. If I have peace with God, right? If I am right with God, then this peace becomes horizontal because then it begins to impact all of the people around me. It begins to impact my neighbors. It begins to impact my coworkers. It begins to impact my family, You have to know if you have peace with God. And how this happened is, 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 is Jesus took on the hostility himself so we could have peace with God. He looked at our sin and he took it upon himself so that you could have peace with God, so that you could have peace with others, and you could even have peace with yourself. See, the gospel is what enables us to have peace and to create peace. Look, this is, not, this is not some sort of harmony, right? This is not some sort of peace treaty, right? Where we're just all gonna kind of get along or, you know, Jesus doesn't have the nine on the Enneagram, okay? That's me, okay? Just, so, and just in case you were wondering, okay? This is different. This is a divine peace that's foundational for his kingdom and this allows all men and women to become friends with a holy God. That's why anyone who calls on the name of the Lord believes that Jesus is the only way to have a relationship with God can have peace with God. I mean, it's why the angels, when they showed up, when Jesus is born on the night that he's, that he's born, they show up and they proclaim and they sing as loud as they can. And they're just saying glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. 
And so we can now wait by helping usher in peace to those who need it. It's because God not only took on your hostility, right? But he took on everybody else's. And so therefore we can live at peace with one another. And so you should be able to just look at the people around you, the people you, you love, right? Lo I mean, love, right? Those people. You should be able to look at them and just say, you know what? I love them because I know Jesus loved them first. So again, we wait patiently. We wait for his arrival. And we rest knowing that he's gonna come again. We wait with purpose, our mission is the Great Commission and we wait peacefully. We live in peace with God, but we also live in peace with others. And so where we find ourselves now, I, I, I've called it God's waiting room. It's not Florida, um, it's, it's here and now, just in case um, you're wondering. But we're waiting for him to accomplish his mission, right? And we can't be like the Griswolds who just kind of bail on it quickly, like, oh, we're out, we're out, okay? We're not here to help. We're not gonna do anything, right? He's called us to live purposely each and every day because we can tr always trust in his promises. He's never not fulfilled one of them. And he's promised that he's gonna return. And so we wait. We wait. Let's pray together. Holy God, we, we wait on you. We wait for your return, knowing that you are coming back. And for, Father, for those that don't know you in this room, for those of you, for those maybe watching online, my prayer is that they come to know you, that they come to know this everlasting Father who, who where God, you've invited us into your family. God, you've called us to, you've called us to be kingdom-minded. We are citizens uh, of heaven. We don't belong here. We belong in a different kingdom. And so God, help us. Be patient with us. And help us to usher in your kingdom. So as we go out, as we live our lives today, as we live our lives this week, God, help us to live with a purpose. Help us to live in surrender and, and surrendering to you each day. I thank you for everybody that's in this room. I thank you for uh, just how you've brought us together to gather, to sing about your return and to praise your holy name. So God, be with us as we go today. And it's your name we pray, amen.